Hello and welcome to this uh, edition of the Old Mutual Thought Leadership podcast series, this time focusing on the 2024 national budget, how it affects you, what you have in your pocket and what you can do with it. I am not alone. I'm Dumi Sang Lo, a financial journalist, and I'll be facilitating this conversation with the head of foundation market at Old Mutual. That's Sanelisi Wenguta, as well as a video director on the tax front, Marcus Buota, who I'll be introducing in a short while. But the takeouts are from this particular discussion really should be how it is that you navigate a precarious economic climate given the outlines of South Africa's fiscal consolidation as well as the debt stabilization that we heard from the finance minister. Let me take this opportunity to introduce my guests, Sanelisi Wenguta. A well, welcome to you. Thank you so much, Timmy San. Great to be here. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for this wonderful platform. I look forward to contribute. I think let's dive deep into it because fiscal consolidation has been top on the agenda with regards to the budget that has been tabled. But suddenly, see what does fiscal consolidation really mean in terms of what I am able to have in my pocket if we are talking about it at a national uh, point of view to the ordinary South African? How do you fiscal consolidate? In simplistic terms and in my simple mind, really, I think it's about what the government is trying to do to close the gap between what is collected as revenue, what is spent, and where there's a gap, what then is borrowed. And as um, the government focuses on closing this gap, ideally, it should be alleviating some pressure on the tax that is needed to be collected from ordinary South Africans. Mm. Interesting, because that's where Marcus comes in. Um, the relief on tax so with regards to how South Africa is planning to conduct uh, this uh, consolidation that uh, has been touted for quite some time, but uh, the fruits have not necessarily been the bigger gains. How much of a burden does that have on the taxpayer? It's got quite a significant burden, especially for the middle tier of your tax brackets. But I need to rewind a little bit yeah. from here and just start at, let's look at the headline revenue and, and what's in the budget. So we're looking at 1.7 trillion that they want to collect in the new year. Mm. We have a very, in my opinion, ambitious growth rate mm -hmm. that they've used to mm. make that projection, which is above 1%. Um, if we go back to 2012, we have been below 1%, yep. but yet, repetitively and consistently, we overestimate the growth rate when we do these budgets. Hmm. And if we look at where collections are at the moment, we're short. Mm. And your big contributor on that has been the mining sector. Um, that short collection is a function of commodity prices that have tanked. Uh -huh. So in the last uh, couple of cycles, we had these windfalls from the mining industry that's been carrying us on the revenue line, which is not there anymore. Um, but there was a little bit of a savior, which was the financial services sector. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the net interest revenue that's been carrying a little bit of tax collection there. So. Thank goodness for that. But again, that's also a cycle. If only we could get these cycles to align, but that's not how the economy works. <laughs> yeah. But let's get back to, to the man on the street and, and his pocket. This is a politically charged budget. Mm -hmm. We can't move away from that. And they had to remain or perceive mm -hmm. that the impact is neutral. So there's very specific language being used in this budget uh -huh. to achieve that. Um, so there is a PR element to this. And saying that there's no increase in taxes is not the full story. Bracket creep, which happens when the, the budgets or the brackets are not adjusted for, uh -huh. is very dangerous. And it mm. hits that middle tier um, of your, your tax tables. Uh -huh. So just to unpack that a little bit, let's say... And that also another assumption that's been built into the, the budgeted revenue is that the employers will be giving above inflationary increases to employees, uh -huh. which pushes them up into the next bracket. Mm. So this year I'm earning, let's call it 500000 Yeah. I'm going to get my increase. Next year I'm earning 
580. Uh-huh. So I'm, I'm lucky with That's that. That's a above. lovely increase. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Above inflationary increases, we'll yeah. have to hold employers to this assumption in the budget. <laughs> hmm. um, so if suddenly you're in a higher bracket and you're going to pay a lot more tax. Yes. So if you now take your your gross less the more tax, uh-huh. you're going to be in a bad position. Now, if we also take your expenses that you have as an individual, which all have gone up mm. above the the key ones have gone up way above inflation, whether it's fuel, whether it's food, mm. there's a whole list of of expenses that we can unpack. Mm. So if you take the cost increase plus the the increase in your taxes, we did a little example just to to calculate this mm-hmm. um, and the values that we looked. At was this 500, 580 mm-hmm. and yeah. in the increases, the, the tax. So this person would have had disposable income of 7,000 after tax and deductions. Mm-hmm. Without adjusting the brackets, this same person is going to have disposable income of about four. Mm-hmm. So I'm not giving you exact numbers, I'm yeah. illustrating a point here. And that mm-hmm. estimation is quite significant. Yeah. <sighs> In your Talk disposable us through that income, which yeah. we don't have. Yeah. People do not have disposable income. Um, the average person, or generally speaking, are under severe financial constraints um, b- because of the costs. So now we don't have this adjustment. Mm. And this has been built into the medium term. Mm. So don't just look at the budget speech language. You have mm. to look at the, the budget review tables that comes with the speech. And if you... Have a look at the medium term. You'll see they have budgeted for 14 billion this year, um, 16 next year, and 18 the following mm, yeah. year with bracket creep. Hmm. And these things add up very quickly. So now, if you take that scenario and you link it up with what's happened with the two pot retirement fund system, right. then it's a very precarious story it's telling Mm -hmm. because you know people are under financial constraint you're going to hit them basically with more taxes when um, increases happen and they they go a tax uh, table up but you're also now giving them access to retirement funds with the one third Mm. that you can draw on an annual basis which has been budgeted for so that's part of our revenue Mm. And we, they're looking for 5 billion rand out of this two-part retirement mm-hmm. system. So what's happening is they're saying you have access to some of your money immediately. We know you're under pressure. Yeah. So we can budget that you will make these withdrawals and we can collect an tax. extra 5 billion hmm. because we're now moving forward the, the tax event. Because it would have happened on retirement only. Correct. Now we're getting the money into the fiscus much sooner. Whew. So now if we put this picture together, it's not the answer that people assumed mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. by saying there's no tax increases. And I'm glad that you've laid it out that way. And this is where Sanelisiwe comes in because uh, many of us uh, as uh, financial service consumers, Mm -hmm. we are looking at how really the two-part system works. Is it beneficial for an individual? But in what circumstance is it then something that you can look at and strategize around? With what Marcus has explained, Sanelisiwe, it becomes a little tricky if you are in a financial position that forces you towards that direction. Mm -hmm. Those calculations you would not have done because your hands are tied. And I think that's where it becomes interesting because it does play on somewhat of a constrained consumer okay. in terms of trying to provide them access to these funds, like is being said. But it's about the journey that you then walk with the customer to understand what it should be used for in order to maximize what government in the PR exercise may intend, (laughs) as well as what you as an individual are trying to to, um, do, right? So if we look at the fact that um, from our old mutual savings and investment monitor, um, which is just a a survey that's done to understand how consumers are uh, relating to their financial well-being, Mm. you see that about 54% of people dipped into their savings last year. Right. And that becomes quite terrifying because if you are thinking about the savings culture of South Africa, which on its own is an interesting topic, it does worry you to say then we the government is 
may be right in assuming that they can collect from people dipping into the um, uh, teapot um, drawdown. Yeah. But what's interesting is then we must just play it back to what happens um, essentially for an individual on the ground, right? And I'll use an example that we actually see within our organization. During a time like COVID, you had an uh, increase in people actually resigning mm. so that they can access their pension because that is one of the uh, very few circumstances currently that allows you to dip into your pension savings and what you then find is that me sunny i will take the whole thing and then i apply again for another job mm. and i'm starting again from scratch it makes sense right because yeah. i have money that is there and i have needs today that i need to be able to service so i can go ahead and make sure that my school fees are paid and the like yeah. what this will mean with two part is that there's a limit to how much you can draw down um uh you know you can only draw down once a year and, mm. and there's a cap on how much of the total part that you can draw down with a minimum that applies but it then allows me to say i'm not going to do something like resign from my job uh -huh. which in itself causes further problems yeah. and causes problems in our unemployment stats i'll dip into this um um uh, pot that i can in, mm -hmm. the, in the the short term pot and be able to service some of my current needs mm -hmm. Now, the question is, what are the current needs that are then being serviced and what really becomes important? Yeah. Because now we also have an issue. I mean, um, even from the savings monitor, you see that there is a big um, drive towards just getting um, credit, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. what people really are worried about, and the stats say about 34% of people just want to reduce their credit and maybe to get a little bit more. Mm. So you start questioning what then will this be used? And I think that becomes the role of us in financial services to really play that financial education game to say what makes sense? What are your needs? How can we ensure that with um, the needs you have, what are the, I can call it a portfolio yeah. of services that will actually meet the need rather than just tapping into this. But at the same time, the needs are there and you want to be able to access that in the short term. Sure. Yeah. Very enlightening. And the needs versus what it is that you are able to do with what's in your pocket, Marcus, must also be thought of with a taxation mindset with regards to drawing down or maybe just a cashing out on a portfolio, as Sunny Lisio was talking there. There's a tax element to it. Uh, you have to give some of it mm -hmm. to the state. And the two-pot system... Talk us through maybe how much of the criticism that has been leveled and the debate around it has led us to a point where the state says it's an element that we can use and consumers are starting to think more critically about how we tap into it and the strategic manner in which we do. So I think the first thing is, if you're under financial constraint, it's, it's very difficult to assess and prioritize and make mm -hmm. sure that you're spending your retirement funds on worthwhile expenses. Mm. Um, I think the challenge is that we're in survival mode, mm. so that money goes to basic needs. But you need to be very careful and make sure you understand what is going to be the, the net in your pocket mm. if you withdraw from this uh, one-third part. Because you would have been taxed on it on an annuity basis, probably, uh -huh. on retirement, and monthly you would have paid the, the tax according to tables. But now if you're going to withdraw on that, whatever you withdraw on, you're going to pay the tax now. Mm. So you might not end up with what you thought you were going to end up with. And then the financial liability um, or spending priority that you had in mind to restructure mm. or settle debt yeah. might not be enough. So mm the consumers will have to do careful planning around this and make mm -hmm. sure they understand the impacts. Hmm. Careful planning. Yes. Sunny Siwa, I want us to go back to the need that uh, you referenced uh, a short while ago. Um, on the side of borrowing and lending, mm. it, of course, it's already at an escalated level. But with the 2024 budget and having touched on the impact and effects of fiscal consolidation, it's even higher. The near-term outlook, uh, Marcus also gave a picture of that, is not necessarily as positive as mm. we would have thought in 2024, having survived uh, the years of COVID-19. How do we look at that picture for a consumer that is looking to, of course, needing to lend, but at a higher cost? 
Absolutely. And I think it, you need to look at it from both the financial lender um, and the borrower's perspective, yeah. right? If we start off with the financial services company that would be giving out this money, it's important to make sure that even the people at the very, um, the face-to-face -face people, the people who are actually issuing the loan, understand what this means, right? So if you are, you have your models that you set out, your credit models that determine Dumisan can get a loan, but Marcus mm. can't, mm. that's great. But if I am talking to an agent sitting in a branch where I'm trying to get a loan, I need to understand, but my tax didn't change. I should be able to qualify for more. Yeah. That creates a frustration in the mm. system. And what does it, it, it then pushes a customer to continue going from uh, provider A to provider B to find mm. money, right? Mm. And that that then means you're just racking up your, your interest that you may be paying. So it's important that we, number one, prioritize the, the advisors or the agents that facilitate these conversa yeah. conversations. Secondly, I think it comes back to understanding what a consumer then does, right? Um, about 40% of South Africans will also put money away in stock files. Or, and I mean, if you think about the way the stock file works, it's either a savings vehicle or a rotating credit uh, um, yeah. uh, vehicle <laughs> as well. So you need to understand that even when we aren't the, financial, uh, the provider, mm -hmm. it's still happening out there. And that means the disposable income that we are trying to look at that may not be written down on paper is also affected, mm. right? And I think the third thing that's also important from a financial services uh, perspective is to figure out what tools, and when I talk tools, I, you know, I talk about the propositions that you put out there, will be suitable in the environment that we are going into in the medium to, to long term. Mm. And that's where something like um, uh, uh, debt consolidation products become quite interesting, where you can look at Dumisang in totality and say she has five loans from everywhere mm. and under mm. the sun. How can I consolidate all of that into one provider mm. such as, say, Old Mutual, mm. and provide a better rate to her? Yeah. Um, but that requires, once again, financial education to come through from uh, the provider side. And when it comes to the customer end, it is important to understand, like Marcus was saying, effectively, nothing has changed um, on the headline, but you are going to be paying more tax as you get an increase. Mm. And if, uh, I mean, simplistically, what you tend to see employers do is those who earn uh, less or in the lower brackets will get a higher um, salary increase than those who earn more. And therefore, it hits those people in the yeah. missing middle again. Yeah. So it becomes um, the responsibility of the consumer as well to understand what does your pocket end up with? Mm. And that pocket also has needs that will also increase, right? So you, you can think about what will happen with taxis. Whether there's a fuel levy increase or not, the taxis are going to increase oh, yeah. their price, right? And we've also got what's happening in the glo um, globally in the macroeconomic environment that will still influence these things. Understanding, okay, my cost of transportation is going to increase. Mm. Cost of education increases mm. every year. Mm. So then how do you also then look at other solutions that will help you prioritize this disposable income in the best way possible? The problem is a lot of the solutions are long-term focused and yeah. the short-term needs are where I think consumers tend to have a gap. And I think that's where the budget essentially does not speak directly to a consumer in a long-term perspective. Yes, it may be long-term for the state, but for us who are economic participants, it doesn't feel that way mm. because our pockets are feeling lighter and the tax implications uh, mark us with borrowing higher. What are they? Lay it bare for us. Are we now talking about the tax implications for of, of the state borrowing? Of us, of you us and borrowing. I and the rest of, of South Africa. I mean, you're going to have less money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the implication. Bottom line. Bottom yeah. line. You're going to have less money. So let me put it to you this way. And also I need to pick up on your comment mm. with uh, the fuel levy. Mm. Yeah. Because that... There were hidden taxes. For yeah. me, this was a stealth budget mm. because when you start adding up all these sidebar taxes, if I can call it mm. that, um, it hits your bottom line. So, for instance, they said there's no fuel levy. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the very next line below fuel levy, there's a carbon tax proposal mm -hmm. and they're increasing the carbon tax levy on fuel. Mm. Um, it was 11 cents for... Uh, petrol and 14 cents for diesel. diesel. 
if you now look at your pump price, mm. then 27% goes to taxes. So there's, if you, then there's plastic bags, mm. there's incandescent bulbs, there's all these other things that have increased with um, the, the no bracket adjustment mm. that gives you less and less money. Now, if you look at where tax contributions are going to come from in this budget, it gives you a very interesting picture. Yeah. Because that is a very clear indication that they see that the consumer spending is not going to go anywhere mm -hmm. because your VAT remained flat. Mm. So they budgeted for 26% um, of your, your total taxes came from VAT last year. They're keeping that at 26% mm. this year. So that's flat. Mm -hmm. If you look at corporate income tax, that one is going down. So last year, it represented 17% of the tax collections. Mm -hmm. This year, it's going to be 16. That's a percentage decline because there's lots happening with corporates. Yeah. And it's not the trajectory that one wanted because the corporates are not contributing to the, the tax base as one would hope for mm. various reasons. But if you look at personal income tax, that's going up 2%. Mm -hmm. So last year we were contributing 38% of uh, the revenue. Next year they want 40% from, from individuals. Ouch. Now, if you analyze the, the personal income tax base, then <laughs> you have about 3 4% of the, the taxpayers mm. contributing 90% mm. of the personal income taxes, yeah. which is basically carrying the country's revenue. So they're looking to us. Mm. This whole budget is looking to the individuals and the consumers yeah. to take the little money that we have in our pocket that's under constraint and give them more and there's no adjustment for inflation, no nothing. Mm. They're not giving anything back. And that's over medium term. So you have to realize that this, they're targeting the individuals to contribute the biggest part to the budget. So when we then talk about financial products and the conversation yeah. we're having, then I guess there's an element of have the awareness of what's happening in this mm. budget, but then there's also a responsibility element, mm. both from the consumer but also from the financial services provider. Uh -huh. Because if you analyze what's going on here, Yes, people will, might have more money if they dip into the retirement funds. Um, there's businesses out there that, you know, want to participate because the consumer spending is remaining flat from yeah. the VAT. Mm. Mm. Everyone wants some, a contribution to bottom line. They're going to go look for the money. So be aware. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> aware we must be. Yeah. Um, and Sunny Lisa, I'm excited because uh, earlier you touched on the financial service products that are available. Um, what is on the market at mm. this point does actually speak to the progress that's been made where it's a consumer focus, mm. but an educational one. Mm. How best does one then navigate this market? You spoke of Stockfells and there is there has been a big drive in formalizing that particular element of savings or money rotating mm. essentially. How broad has the market become with regards to I may not have too much, but I need to be putting in even a little bit, mm. even if it's in a tax-free vehicle. But we are talking the same language with putting money back in some way or the other. Yeah. Um, it becomes very interesting. And I mean, if we talk about stock falls and formalizing it, I, my personal opinion is one that uh, depends on the day and mm -hmm. the mood of the weather, because you can think about formalizing this industry as actually taking away power mm -hmm. in a system that works really well in itself, mm. right? But at the same time, formalizing it means being able to protect the consumer a lot more against, you know, the aunt that runs away with the stock yeah. money for that year. <laughs> um, but it, it becomes about navigating that fine line in terms of formalizing structures like that while still letting them run themselves in the successful nature that they do. So if we talk about stock files, for instance, you can look at, you know, the burial um, societies type, which are focused on being able to provide a benefit at the point of death, mm -hmm. and that reduces the burden on the family when someone p passes away. Or like I said earlier, the rotating credit, I like to call it, but you mm -hmm. know, it's your turn this month, it's your <laughs> turn that month. Um, and 
how do we ensure that people understand that that is literally moving money around? Um, so the stock files, I think, will continue to be prevalent. They continue growing um, in what we're seeing as just, you know, the mood of the, the country at the moment is one where there's a lot of distrust. Um, you know, it's a bit of a dampened mood, but we're hoping that it will pick up in time. So the trust in the financial services is one that we, um, as companies like Old Mutual, mm. need to continuously work on. But stock files, I see, continuously having a very important uh, focus. But when we also then talk about financial products, it is important. And I think the learning that we are doing as um, corporate is becoming a lot more uh, uh, detailed in that you can look at a funeral insurance product as an example and say that is a risk product. You are trying to protect yourself against a um, risk that you know is going to happen. It's just about the timing. But what's interesting about a lot of South Africans is they actually use that as a savings vehicle, yeah. right? So they will actually take out a funeral policy on uh, Goko and Malume, whatever it may mm. be. When they pass away, um, they may then use that as I'm taking from my savings to provide for this need mm -hmm. or I use that money for other purposes. Mm. So it's important to then figure out how do we take the conversation around spending some of the benefits that come out from these financial products in the best way possible, but not enforcing our view of financial wellness onto a consumer, but understanding what they are trying to do with uh -huh. it overall. Um, but then you also have a whole range of products, which I think one of the thing that one of the things that is becoming important is we need clarity on how we are going to create generational wealth sounds so extreme, but just being able to reduce the burden of what I experience in my time right. for, you know, the ones that will come after me. And then you can start looking at social grants and the like. And how do you ensure that when the person who's receiving the social grant passes away, mm. they can enable some sort of protection for those that they do take care of with those products, right? So you need to be able to look at those avenues as well as a financial services provider. But the big one will mm. always be in the lending space, mm. right? Consumers will continue to be constrained, as Marcus has outlined. And we need to be responsible in our lending, but understanding what a pivotal role it plays right. in keeping families afloat mm. and um, uh, leveraging that against what the government needs to provide in terms of social grants and the like. You mentioned a very sensitive one in South Africa social grants mm. and how that is a provision to make sure that a certain part of the South African community that is financially inactive gets to a point of seeking to be better participation. And yes, we may be far from an equilibrium uh, uh, given South Africa's history here, mm. Marcus, but the social grant beneficiaries, they play in a space where there was a special commission even that uh, was set up by the presidency speaking of zero vetted uh, VAT products. And in this budget, uh, we had a close session with the minister and he was bold in saying, oh no, we're not even going to whisper to you when we raise it or where it stands or how they are thinking of the methodology behind VAT increases and zero rated products. But you said consumer spending is expected to be flat. Now, how does the state beg on making a little bit of money on that side of that coin? Because it does not sound like a pretty picture to tell in terms of any type of revenue that will go into the coffers of the state. That is a very explosive topic mm. because of the demographic that, that it affects. Mm -hmm. So even with your zero-rated products, um, it's still regressive. So it's not income-based mm. or bracketed. Um, everyone pays the same. So your low-income earner pays the same mm. as a high net worth individual. Mm. Um, and that basket of goods that, that zero-rated is maybe not enough anymore mm. um, because of all the other increases uh, that has happened. Mm. They can't touch this because it's election year. Yep. It will probably cause an uprising if they do. <laughs> um, but to come back to the social grants, the problem we have is, and I have the same concern for all the registered taxpayers that, mm. that pay money who is now under pressure, as mm -hmm. we've, we've uh, been talking about, they're putting everyone under pressure with no light at the end of the tunnel. 
the budget does not have capacity to change the situation soon, mm. medium term. Our infrastructure is failing us dismally. Um, so not just the commodity prices, if we talk about the mines again as mm -hmm. an example, it's not just the commodity prices, it's also the volumes of what they were not able to export, mm. which has a big impact mm. on those businesses. Um, just last week, I saw Anglo 90% down. They're going to retrench. Yeah. Pick and pay, in, in their history, they're now doing a rights issue. Yeah. Tiger Brands, and the list goes on and on. Yeah. So if we can't grow the economy and start employing people, then that social grant is, that's barely keep, keeping people alive it's been baked into the budget. It's not changing. But we're not going to be able to wean people off that and make mm -hmm. them economically active if we don't address the unemployment, which is linked to growth, mm -hmm. which means stop stealing all the money. Just be like other countries. There's corruption everywhere. Yeah. Just leave something for us to run the country with. Hmm. That's all we're asking. Efficient corruption. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think we can hope for anything other than that at this point if we look at their history. But then at least we can invest in infrastructure and make hmm. changes. Hmm. And, you know, when I say invest in infrastructure, I'm not talking big, complicated things here. Go to the Eastern Cape. It's scenic. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Go put up a hotel there, make it a tourist destination, employ the people locally that can walk to this hotel and work. Mm -hmm. Small little efforts like that. That's all we need. And slowly, those regions and areas will develop. You'll see people become economically active. It changes the whole thing around. We mm. just want small change. What we do have now, Sanelisiwe, is that something in the social uh, grant dispensation mm. in the country. What are you able to do with it, given what uh, the financial service market has? If, uh, for example, we use the 350 SRD grant, a cautious mm. matter at this point, uh, mm. because we don't know whether mm. we have it permanently or not. But as Marcus said, most of the social relief in this country is likely to be with us for quite some time. What can I do with it? Mm. The range of social grants is wide, mm -hmm. and um, the the intention behind it varies. Right, you have your child grants, which are intended to provide relief to parents who cannot necessarily sustain their children. You have your um, pensioner grants, which are meant to combat some of the problems that we're having with the pension, and I suppose. Uh, there's a whole mm. balancing game that happens there mm. with some of the reforms that are taking place. You've got some of your disability grants as well that play out there. Um, and like you're saying, you've got the 350, um, I think they like to call it the COVID grant yes. sometimes, yeah. um, that is still with us. What we need to be able to understand is how little that money is, right? Mm. And how many people it sustains. So when we start looking at providing value for um, individuals who are earning grants, we need to take into consideration what that pocket looks like mm. and what it needs to be able to do, but also the risk that it faces, like I said earlier, mm. if it were to stop in totality. Um, and if we also step back and go back into history, um, there was a time where, you know, fi uh, financial services providers could sell um, into uh, two SASA grant recipients and not, uh, be able to deduct and the yes. like. But because of malpractices that also happened within the industry, that's mm -hmm. something that needed to change. And what you're seeing, and I mean, it's something that we as all, all Mutual are also looking into and uh, quite uh, trying to advance that a lot is how do we go back into that environment to say something as simple as a funeral insurance product will alleviate some pressure mm -hmm. at a certain point in time, but doing it in a responsible manner, understanding the, the amount of money that is available to be used for all the things that it is, but still trying to bridge the gap between the, the now generation and the mm. future. So, you know, you, you have a lot of those products coming around. But what I find interesting, and I'm, I'm interested to see where some of these models will go, is how do you use some of that insight to understand the earning 
capacity of a household, right? Because mm-hmm. you can have multiple people in one household earning certain levels of income. How do we use that and some of the modeling tools and, uh, you know, all the fancy terms of AI and the like mm-hmm. to understand then what products can you then design that can meet the pocket that is there? Yeah. But it does require us to understand that looking at an individual's income in South Africa will never give you the full story. Hmm. Interesting. What was popular was tax-free saving accounts. Um, (laughs) Many of us uh, who are parents, we jumped onto that bandwagon, got some for, you know, the little ones. Uh, How far of progress have we made in South Africa, especially on that particular vehicle of a financial service product and uh, even the likes of retail savings bonds, Marcus, because we want to make as much of a saving, especially on the tax front as possible. And I think the question I'm asking really here is, have we seen that there are products that work and we actually can maximize on ensuring that there's inclusion irrespective of who is the big earner? I have a tax-free savings account. <laughs> so let's, let me put that on the table and we start there. It's a good product mm. and a very necessary product. Mm. Um, my question is just, is it a high-income earner like yep. myself mm. that's making use of it, that's getting a bang for my buck because I'm, I'm maximizing a return now? Or is it accessible to the people who need a little bit of a savings plan? Mm. Uh, for future, because I mean, the construct of the product make is brilliant and it makes complete sense. Uh-huh. So you can do thirty six thousand rand per annum that you can contribute to this product, and then they cap it mm. to a lifetime of five hundred. But if you started very early on when this came into play, and if you open accounts for your children, mm. um, with uh, <laughs> with interest. That's going to grow very nicely. Compounding yeah. interest is a wonderful thing. Um, and I encourage everyone that's able to to participate in this mm-hmm. product because when those children are of age, they will have a nice little nest, nest egg mm-hmm. um, that's not going to be part of a retirement regime that yeah. contributes the 5 billion rand to the budget. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes directly to what you referenced, Annelise, mm. around that creation of wealth. Mm. Uh, we may start at the basics in South Africa, but where should the state then be meeting? The financial service sector, mm. because the products are there. Uh, what we don't have is the avenues of creating more money, uh, <laughs> putting it somewhere so that uh, it does what uh, it should be doing while we even sleep. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'll touch on that. I also yeah. <laughs> want to come back to the the, uh, the tax-free savings one yes. to say what's important is that you need to understand what products are made for what sort of investment horizon. Mm. So what goal you're trying to get to. And like uh, Marcus was saying, if it's About a longer term horizon, it tends to be designed for a more affluent Mm. customer. Whereas what I'm interested in, and I'm quite, um, I keep looking out for this, is what will happen to make things like our um, market, money market Mm -hmm. accounts a lot more accessible, a lot more uh, revenue generating in terms of interest and the like. So the products are there from mm. the side of the financial uh, service sector. Where does government meet you halfway in terms of uh, getting an acceleration, a marriage of two minds? Mm. And maybe we can even start with this tax-free savings um, account concept, mm. which, like Marcus is saying, is is geared for a more affluent customer, primarily because of the investment horizon over which you can make money, mm. right? And this comes back to just some of the fees that go into how you manage an account like that. And I think one of the things that would be interesting to see is how government may look at and I, I don't have great ideas on this, but, you know, it's always interesting. Mm-hmm. But money market accounts, which are about a lot more of a short term uh, 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 investment horizon, but can be a lot more accessible and can then start providing a, a complementary product, I'll mm-hmm. say, to some of the stock file savings that we have. Yeah. Because a lot of people want to be able to put aside money in order to meet a 12 year, a 12 year, 12 month uh, period. Mm-hmm. Right. And then if we also then come back to the question that you asked specifically, it's that we need to be able to understand the needs of the customers, how best to meet them, and how the limitations that we put into place, either 
increase the cost of being able to meet the needs of the customers or they prevent the appetite of a financial services company from going in and meeting that need. And for me, I think it, it comes down to ensuring that there is an alignment of minds in terms of what is the most topical thing to need uh, to, uh, to, to solve for. And I think the, the savings one is a good example still, where if we want to be able to um, monitor the stock file market, like you're saying, maybe formalize it a bit to protect those individuals that may be uh, left wanting otherwise, mm. we need to consider what that may do to the overall market. Mm. So if you're saying mm. that uh, you need to be able to have X amount minimum in order, and it must be invested in such an account, but the need that we're trying to solve for is a six month need, mm. Myself as a financial services provider, my hands will be slightly tied as to how I can meet that need because at the same time, I need to be able to take shareholder um, money invested in meeting this need and make sure that all the stakeholders are met so that, you know, we can contribute to that corporate tax as yeah. well yeah. <laughs> that is reducing at the same time. So it's about working together. And I think the conversations are there. There's a lot of platforms that are out there that look at what the the, the customer need is and how we can work together, whether it's with the regulator, government, um, or with the consumers themselves to, to better address the needs. On that note, Marcus, so what more really could the state have done to try cushion the South African consumer economic participant uh, as opposed to taking <laughs> much from what we are going to give into that viscous? So I think our, the construct of our budget has been tested mm -hmm. over and over throughout <laughs> um, the last three, few years mm -hmm. um, since the democratic election. And they've got the formula down to a T. Mm -hmm. Also, all the constraints that we've been dealing with has been there for some time. Mm -hmm. So the way the budget is put together, um, it's done in a very good way mm -hmm. and very cleverly but it doesn't leave any room to maneuver to assist us. Oh. You have 20 million people on social grounds, more or less. Mm. That's a big chunk of the population. You have 14 million registered taxpayers, of which probably 7 million mm -hmm. um, pay tax because the others are below mm -hmm. the threshold. Mm -hmm. So that's a very small base contributing that 40%. Huh. So that 40% contribution needs to pay social grants. We have to cover the debt cost, mm. so our debt service cost. Yeah. Um, the allocation for the, the, the interest on the debt is the same as our healthcare budget. Actually, I think uh. it's bigger. Uh. Um, sp I think spending has reduced there. I mean, I saw Gauteng is up in arms because they have no budget to employ a whole cohort of uh, medical professionals yeah. that can't find jobs. So that's where you can see things are starting to go wrong because our spending priorities have to be redirected. Mm -hmm. Pay grants, pay debt mm -hmm. interest, pay state wages. Mm -hmm. We are the biggest employer in the country. Of course. Um, and there's labor issues there because mm. they strong arm the state into uh, giving increases in gratuity payments. Like, very interestingly, last year's mm -hmm. budget, if I may. Yes. We had the tension with the labor unions. They said, we're not going to give increases. Mm -hmm. They then had obviously um, locked heads and there was conflict around that. They then said, let's give a gratuity payment, mm -hmm. which they did. Then in the following year's budget, that was baked in. Mm -hmm. So they took that as if it has always been there and then they get, gave an oh. increase on top mm -hmm. of that for spending for, for state wages. And it's things like that that upsets me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's a very big expense and it's not always a productive expense. Mm -hmm. we, we have to keep that in mind. So that's, so that's the, the third big ticket item that's not giving us any room to maneuver. The last one is the obvious one, state-owned companies. Oh, yeah. So again, this budget said no assistance 
And everyone was like, yay. Oh, we know what that means now. <laughs> Tell us the fine print. <laughs> we entered into that agreement to restructure ESCOM, which right. was a three-year agreement. Mm -hmm. So this year we are giving them 60 billion. <laughs> and next year we're giving them 110 billion. Mm -hmm. We just said no assistance because we're not giving new assistance in this budget, mm -hmm. but it gets rolled over mm. from the previous one. Plus, there's a guarantee for Transnet um, of 45. So if Transnet is not able to make their commitments, that guarantee will be called upon. Mm. So we don't have room to maneuver, and there's the big deficit. So we tapped into that Reserve Bank Reserve. At least it shields us from an increase in more debt service costs. Mm, yeah. So that was a, a, a very good thing. But that's a once-off. I can't make a habit out of that. Hmm. So I guess it's sad news. Yeah. There's not much more we can do except grow the economy. Mm. Suddenly, Celia wants to add in there. Yeah, I, I think you, you bring up some interesting topics which, you know, make bring to light the difficulty that we are in as a country, right? Like you're saying, um, how conducive is the uh, government wage bill spend? Mm -hmm. Then you come back and think, okay, without that, how many families mm -hmm. are then not fed? Mm -hmm. So then now you're tossing between these two. Um, then you say, okay, but um, we have a lot of corruption in our state-owned enterprises. And then you realize, well, without pumping anything into this, the whole economy breaks. Yeah. So now you, 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 you're working with this dance and, you know, let's set aside who's at fault here. Right. But just look at it at a point in time. And I would love to hear some of the conversations that go into this dance. And how do you then prioritize it, especially in an election year? Mm. Because that then becomes the biggest interest area. And that's why this budget is so brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, a brilliant budget. I thought budget. it was very, they smart. did a very good mm. job. Yeah. It was smart. Yeah. Mm. It was, it was smart. definitely smart. Mm. And then they've realized that private sector is the answer mm -hmm. to the nightmares that we have. Um, so there was a big focus on uh, private public partnerships. Partnerships, mm. yes. If we can create uh, a landscape where there's this confidence and the corporates that do have money and want to invest mm. are then brought to the forefront to do that, and we facilitate make doing business a little bit easier, mm. that will grow the economy. That's, mm. that's the kind of thing that we need. Mm. Government is not going to invest in fixed infrastructure. This has now become a private sector problem yeah. so that they can be kept in business. Mm -hmm. With that kind because of their capital. business is under threat at this point with the failed infrastructure. Um, yeah. So this is our answer, I guess. <laughs> Building economic growth. Mm. It's not just rhetoric. Whether we're in an election year or not, uh, we know South Africa has been struggling with that. Uh, San Elise, what your takeaway from this budget as to how we reach that point. Because without that economic growth, that means the swelling of the unemployment ranks continues. Um, then we have to, as a country, continue with social relief. But mm. also it minimizes the economic participation of all South Africans. Mm. Simplistically, the mood is nicer when we're growing as a country, yeah. right? So let's start there. <laughs> and I think we, we, under, we sometimes undermine just what the mood and just general happiness does to actually motivate people to go out and look for jobs, go out and start a small business, go out and, you know, really try and hustle. So I think we need to understand that that mood is one that plagues us all. And, you know, if we then turn it into what the financial services sector will face is that if you are not in a, you know, growth environment, the people who are supposed to be um, receiving the, the services that you provide and actually um, having their needs met, they don't want to pay the premium that you have. Okay. What that then does is it causes problems on our end because we are then putting capital into reaching these customers, making sure that we can provide for these needs, but that capital is not being paid back. Okay. And if that happens, then we have a problem because then okay. the financial services contribution that you saw last year becomes a product of how much can the customers persist with the products that you you have out there. So I think when we when we talk about you know how we got to this point and what there is to grow, it's it's it sounds simple, mm. um, but it's it's a difficult problem to solve. 
economic activity needs to continue happening and it needs to continue growing in order for us to be able to get to a better point as a country. I'm quite an optimist in general and, um, you know, I am, a, as all of us are, I love this country, mm. right? Mm. I love it. I, I love the problems we have. I enjoy being able to complain about the things that we are seeing. But there's only so much you can do until it actually breaks mm. the system. Mm. Breaking the system is not where we want to go. Mm. Parting shot from you, Marcus. I guess the people that wanted to leave have left already. <laughs> so it's up to us to try and come up with and a bring solution it together. and keep things together. But, I mean, we are a net exporter, mm -hmm. and that's very important to note. We need to keep it. And if the, our failed infrastructure is not fixed, mm -hmm. we can't export. That impacts our, our income statement. Um, that has an impact on economic growth. And I have come across such heartbreaking stories because you have people full of hopes and dreams. Mm. They are hustling. Mm trying to make ends meet. They want to start a business, do a project, pitch. We're sitting in the studio. Yeah. I have so many friends trying to pitch, uh -huh. um, but there's no funds. Mm. Investments are being pulled, mm. and they're just not getting ahead. And yeah. It's heartbreaking to see how they just keep pouring themselves into to an effort to try and hustle and make money and nothing happens. We need to create jobs. Mm. If the infrastructure just returns to what it once was and we can keep on doing business will grow be a good start. Yeah. Mm. and that's how we wrap up this edition of the old mutual thought leadership podcast series focusing on the 2024 national budget remember old mutual is a licensed financial services and registered credit provider old mutual do great things